Let's pray. Our gracious Father, ah, truly you are holy. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, Lord. Thank you for the resurrection that we celebrate today. Lord, I, I pray that you speak to us, that you would speak your truth into our lives, uh, that it would pierce into our hearts, and in the midst of this, that it would draw us closer to you. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the field of cryogenics. Um, it's, it's not a dead field, so to speak. That really wasn't intended, but that's pretty funny right there. It's, it's not, it, there's still people looking at it, but for the most part, people generally accept we're not even close to that being a possibility. But you may not have heard of, of a new thing called technological singularity. And what technological singularity is, is the idea that you can upload your brain and the synapses and all, that, and, and all of that up into a computer. And, and there's, there's people that are kind of in, searching this, and the reason they, they, well, this seems to make sense because of snaps in your brain, the, the way the connections are, it's either on or off. And so, the, well, the computer language is ones and zeros, so it's either on or off. So the thought is, well, we could do that. We could upload our brains into the computer, and as long as nobody unplugs it, we can live forever. And I find that interesting because there's people that are seriously looking into this. And I have a, a couple, with that, there's multiple problems with that. I, what of the, the chemical uh, and, and the hormonal things that influence our actions? Uh, is the brain synapses really all there is to life? And, and if I were uploaded, so to speak, would it really be me? Those are pretty simple questions. But I think there's an underlying motivation that drives at this that's in the heart of man, and that is the motivation to live forever. And we see the author of Ecclesiastes write, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity into man's hearts, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. You see, ultimately, there's this, this, in our hearts, there's this desire to exist forever. And, and that's why we, what drives us, even Benjamin Franklin is noted in the, the Smithsonian has a magazine, and they noted a story about Benjamin Franklin where he was in England, and it was around se- mid-1770s, and he poured out a bottle of wine and three dead uh, flies dropped out of it too. And well, after a little bit of time, two of the flies got, came back to life and flew away. And Benjamin Franklin was noted saying, I wonder if I got locked into a wine barrel and I could live in there and I could come back and see what happens in America in a hundred years. Well, that didn't, he didn't do that, I don't believe. Maybe he did, and I just had the wrong history book. But, but we, look, we see it's in the hearts of us. But, but the, the other part of this that I look at, there's a bigger question at work. You see, if I uploaded my brain, and it, the question is, is it really me? I wonder if we have a misnomer of really even what life is. Do we get what life is? And that's what, that's what we're going to look at today. What is life? As we speak of the resurrection, what truly does life mean? Uh, Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 24 through 29, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. You know, there's a, an interesting section in Ezekiel that, that I find fascinating because it's, if you're not familiar with the prophecies of the Old Testament, sometimes they, they're bizarre. And if you want a really odd read, go back to Ezekiel. But a lot of people want to go into Revelation and read that, and I think that's fun. But Ezekiel's crazy. There's all types of stuff. But here's what the prophet says in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 10. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out of the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, they were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause the flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord." So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling of the bones came together, and bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there was sinews on them, flesh coming upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said, prophesy to the breath, 
Prophesy, son of man, say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breathe, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. It's, it's, this, this section is, is written to the nation of Israel surrounding uh, that they will once again be a nation, a strong nation, uh, though they looked dead. But we see here what's interesting is there's a picture given of physical life. All the sinews, all the bones, everything's there. Oh, the whole thing is, the whole being is there, but there's no life. It has to be breath. The breath of life has to be given. That's interesting. I don't know if you're, if you're not familiar with the story of how you were created uh, or how we were created. It was in the garden. God said, let us make man in our image. And out of the, the, the dust on the ground formed man. If you go to chapter 2 of Genesis, you see man's not alive until God breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And so we, we get this picture of what life is, is this design factor where God has created us and designed us. But what's the purpose there? If you're familiar with the Garden of Eden account, we had face-to-face -face conversations with God. Adam had this face-to-face -face contact, and he was given one rule. You see, he was given one rule in the garden, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. That's the one rule. Somebody had said after Good Friday service, what would have happened if he hadn't eaten it? And I told him, well, I would have screwed it up for all of us because that tree probably looked all right. And I would have questioned, God, are you sure? But he eats the tree and then what? And God's process, when you eat of this tree, you're going to die. And as soon as Adam sets it in his mind that I'm going to take a bite of this, he spiritually died right then. Physical death then enters the scene, and we see them die later on. But physical death enters. The immediate death was the spiritual death because we know what happens is Adam is now separated from God. Man is separated from God because sin entered the scene. And what that presents to us is interesting because that is passed on to us. Paul says in, in Romans 5, 15 through 17, I'll just pick up in verse 16 here. For the judgment that followed the trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life of the one, through the one man, Jesus Christ. So break this down to make it easy. What's being said here is we've inherited a sin nature. We've inherited death. You may not have thought of this. If you come in today and you've not committed your life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to make it abundantly clear. You're dead. I don't want to mince any words. I don't want you to miss here. I don't want to falsely bring you into something and only for later on you find out it's a bait and switch. I want you to know that I think you're dead in your sins. And I'll explain to you how I know that towards the end of the service today. But oftentimes we'll fight that. You, you, you don't have life. The, 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 what the other half of this, or what Paul presents, is that you only receive life, this eternal life, through Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the gift that God has given you. Have, we've separated from God based on our sin. There's a problem there. Our sin has to be dealt with, and that's what we talk about today. But before we get there, you may not be convinced that you're dead. So let me convince you that you're dead. You see, we've bought into this. All, often many of us in our lives in the West, we, we look to these various things for hope. We look at the political season, maybe, maybe the politicians, and they get that we're all dead. They understand this. They may not know it in, in the theological terms, but they know what to promise. I'll promise you security. I'll promise you money in your pocket. I'll promise you all these various things in order to entice you with hope. Let me tell you, they can't promise to give you life. We follow after many different things. In the West, we don't want for anything. This is an old statistic, but I, I think it's probably still fairly accurate. If you make, it was, at the time, it was $30,000. If you made $30,000, you were in the richest 95% of the world. That's low now for us. We look at that in terms of, we, we don't want for anything in the West. What I want, I run down to Walmart and get it. Then it breaks, and guess what? I send my wife to go get another one. And she yells at me and says, why are you buying it from Walmart? 
I say, because it's right there. <laughs> but we look at this in terms of we don't want for anything, and yet we continue to attempt to fill our lives with things. And, and ultimately, we buy into this concept. When I was in Russia several years ago on a, on a mission trip, they had these guys that would sell stuff. They, and, and I don't see it as much in Spokane, but they had guys that would sell things, and they'd be on the side of the road, and, stuff, and, and you'd be in the city. We were in St. Petersburg, and they'd have stuff everywhere. And you could buy a Rolex watch as long as you didn't look close because it was really a Folex. And I looked at those watches and thought, these are pretty nice watches. But I thought, that's what life is. That's what our lives apart from Christ are. They're a Folex watch. You see, I can buy the watch. I can put it on. I could fool you into thinking that I have a Rolex watch. I can fool everybody. I can put it away. I can take care of it. I can look. I can, oh, man. I could even probably for a time fool myself. But the watchmaker knows. That's not a Rolex. That's a Folex, you fool. And many of us are walking around with lives that are Folexes. Wanting to hide the fact that we're, oh no, I, I've got a, a rich life. I've got, and now and you might be able to, uh, for a while, be happy. But happiness is feel, fleeting. You see, you can fool a lot of people. But when you're alone, you fight the quiet. This is why in our cars we turn the radios on. This is why when we sit in our houses and it's silent, we have to turn something on. I need to be distracted. This is why when we, we get to these points of life where I just, I just, I, I can't, I don't want to be alone. Why? Because I'm alone with me. And I know there's something wrong. We also see this lived out because the silence hurts. We try to fill the void. Various different things, alcohol, drugs, pornography, work, exercise. We try to fill the void that's there. I don't want to be in the silence. I want to fill this void. And we start to live our lives in these other areas and start to live these things out, whatever that is, hoping that that void will be filled, hoping that I don't have to live in the silence of understanding that I'm walking around with a Folex watch dead in my sins. You see, we, the, the nation that we have has abundant riches. Why is suicide so high? Why is depression so high? Why are other mental illnesses in the nation that has been born out and has the most stuff? If stuff is supposed to fix it, if that's what my life is about, if that's really, if I get more things and it really is going to bring me life, why is it that we're killing ourselves? Why is it that our kids are doing the same? Why is it that about every other week in the military I have to do a suicide briefing? Why does this happen? Why, why is it that we're in this spot? That's because we don't want to acknowledge the fact that we're walking around with Olex watches for life. And so when we get to this point, I, it, it's important for us to understand, as we fill the void, there's a denial that we have, a denial of wanting to live in reality. I'm getting older. Some of you have noticed. But I, it, it's interesting as I get older, there's a lot of things changing. And some of you are farther along on the path than me, and you can tell me it doesn't get better, and I don't want to hear that. And I wake up in the morning, and I roll over, and, and sometimes I'm able to get out of bed on my own. Most of the time, there's a kid pulling my arm. Come on! And as they pull, there's cracks and pops that aren't supposed to happen. And my feet hit the ground, and at one point, I used to spring up ready for the day. Now I get up and crack, 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 crack. And wondering, am I even going to make it to the bathroom? <laughs> and I get there and have to reorient myself because my eyes still haven't opened yet. And I realize, boy, at one point, this wasn't life. Getting older sucks. At one point, I was a spry young man. The day would hit and I'd jump out of bed, not knowing what I was going to do. I'd just get out of bed. I'd wake, boop, I'll go do something. 
But now the alarm rings. I don't even have to have an alarm anymore. We got so many kids in the house. Kids running around bah, 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 on the stairs outside of my door. Bah, 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 go away. Dad, I know you're awake. I heard your elbow pop. <laughs> and I sit there as, oh, and I get up. And then later in the day, it's not any better. You see, at some point, something died inside of my stomach. And no matter what I eat now, everybody pays for it. It used to be, I used to be able to eat anything I wanted. You got a nail, I'll eat it. Whatever it is, now whatever I eat, I wonder, hmm, did it come back alive? What happened? And I realize with life, as this, as this progresses, there's pain associated with being alive. Now I'm feeling the physical parts. You see, prior to this, I used to feel the spiritual parts, but I'll get to that in a moment. You see, we like to deny the reality of life. There's a concept in, in mental health counseling and in psychology called depressive realism. It's a fairly well-established concept. It was started back in 1979 when some researchers found out, interestingly, that depressed people have a more accurate view of reality than non-depressed people. You might think, what? No way. Yes, that's true. It's, and and it, this is a study, this, is, this, has been re, this has been validated numerous times. Depressed people have a better, a, a more, let me not say better, a more accurate outlook on the reality of life the non-depressed people because they realize I don't have control over anything. That's one of, the, one of the things. And so when they measure reality, what they start to see is depressed. Wow, it's interesting. Why? And, and so there's this false sense for us that we actually have control over things, that I can control getting older, that I could control dying by uploading my brain into something or locking myself into a wine barrel. For some people, that might be enticing. Or freezing my brain. I, there was a rumor, I don't know if it's true, that Walt Disney had done that. If so, I think, boy, what a dork. <laughs> we live in a magical kingdom where you can freeze your brain and come back to life. But, but we, live, they, they, we have this notion that we, have, we can do this. And it's this reality that we want to, I want to just control everything that I got. And, and, but the reality is I don't have any control over anything. Now, I think this is a byproduct of sin. This, this concept that I can control things. Because if I acknowledge that I have very limited control over things, what starts to happen is I start to feel a little unstable. We call it cognitive dissonance. I don't, I don't like that feeling. So I think it's a byproduct of sin, this false presumption that we have control. Because if I recognize I don't have control, then I might have to acknowledge there's one that does. And I might have to acknowledge that my life is really not everything that I thought it was. I've got the Folex. And I'm trying to pass it off as something real. But really the, the big reality that many of us try to escape is in the end you're going to die. This is an uplifting. <laughs> Welcome to church. One day you're going to die. That's, but in the, there's a calendar out there. And it's got a date on it, and that's your last day. I was driving home from a marriage conference my wife and I did last week, and we're driving home, and we're, it was out in Chelan, and, and we're coming through, and there's no, if, you, if you've driven through highways, there's nothing there. I'm sorry for you folks that live in Lincoln County. There's nothing. There's, it's just wheat fields, and right now, there's no wheat. It's just fields of stubble, and you drive. And as I drive, I think, and for some reason, as we're driving home, my wife is sitting next to me, and I think... Hey, you know, one day we're going to be dead. It's a nice, light conversation. And my wife says, thank God. Now, I wasn't sure if I should be offended or not. But then I said, you know, what's interesting is one day my parents are going to be dead. And that, that was a little harder to take. And then I said, well, you know, one day your parents are going to be dead. And then I thought, hey, what are we going to do with all this stuff? No, I didn't think that. But, but this reality kind of... And, and when I was a kid, I wasn't ever going to die. Man, I was going to live forever. You kids are not going to live... One day you're going to crack and pop just like me. And you're going to wonder, what was wrong with that burrito? <laughs> but we have this notion that I'm going to... I'm gonna live, and, but it sets in. I'm gonna, there's, a, there's a date. God knows when it is. 
right here. That's the last day I've got you on the earth. Jesus spoke about this in a parable, or in a, in a parable in, in the Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Uh, rather, not a parable, a story. But he said to him, uh, man, who made me judge and arbiter over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all the covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, in the land of the rich man produced, many of, uh, plenty, produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I will build larger ones. And there I will store my, all my grain and my goods. And I will say to them, my, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. What does that mean? All of the work, the writer of Ecclesiastes had it right, is meaningless. We work and we toil, and in the end, I'm going to hand it off to my kids, and they may, I don't know what they're going to do with it. That's why I'm spending it now. I've seen them. Let's see what they buy. No, we work and we toil. But so we have to, this, there, there's an interesting dynamic in our culture. Our, 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 we don't move our grandparents and our parents into our homes anymore. It used to be that was the norm. Death was normal. Death now is something we're afraid of. And I, I think that there's an, an interesting piece with that. We've, we take death and we put it in the hospice. And we let people go there. And we say, well, I'll go visit them. That's not going to happen in my house. I plan on my kids, at least every one of them, changing a diaper or two of mine. That's, that's my plan. That's my retirement plan. I'm going to make sure it happens. But I'll be riding my Harley, filling her up, getting ready to go see Creighton. But we, 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 so we have this notion, but, but there's a concept here where if we have to deal with that, we need to real, really realize it. And that's important for us because in the end, what really matters with this is do you have life? You see, physically, you're going to die. But at that point, what happens? Do you have life? You see, this is what we get wrong in thinking that we can upload our brains, thinking that we can, we can cryogenically freeze because if this is it, man, this is terrible. I want something more. For the Christian, we look at this and think, boy, it's never going to get any worse than this. For the non-believer, this is it. This is as good as it gets. You see, in the end, when it comes to that point, do you have life? Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus is the, the author of life. In the end, all that will matter is what you did with him. In Acts, we read, you denied the holy righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised to, from the dead. To this we are witnesses. John 11, Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? You see, in the end, all that's going to matter is what did you do with Jesus? Do you have life? Did you trade your Folex in for the real thing? Because that's when it's really going to count. It's not going to matter how much money you made. It's not going to matter all of the, the different things that we put value in. While I don't want you to dismiss that as though those things aren't important, it's important to be responsible with our things. But, but the reality is, in the end, there's going to be one question. What did you do with Jesus? You see, Paul says it like this in Romans uh, chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the Scripture says, everyone who is, believes in Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, what's interesting with this is if you're sitting here today dead, there is a way to receive life.
it seems there's so much we haven't lost As we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked And one by one the enemy has whispered lies And led them off as slaves Well, that you are God, yours is the victory We know there is more to come that we may not yet see So with the faith you've given us We step into the valley unafraid Hey Cause we call out to dry bones come alive Come alive We call out to dead hearts Come alive Come alive And up out of the ashes Let us see an army rise We call out to dry bones Come alive God of endless mercy God of unrelenting love Rescue every daughter, bring us back the wayward sons And by your Spirit breathe upon them Show the world that you alone can save You alone can save As we call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. And up out of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones, come alive. So breathe, O breath of God, now breathe, O breath of God. Breathe, O oh breath of God, now breathe. Oh, breathe, O oh breath of God, now breathe, O oh breath of God. Breathe, O oh breath of God, now breathe. As we call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive. Come alive, and up out of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones, come alive. Oh, we call out to dry bones, come alive. Oh, come alive. What does the resurrection signify? You see, the story goes this in Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord had descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for... I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb and with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. You see, what does the, de- the resurrection signify? Paul refers to the, uh, a statement, O oh, death, where is your sting? You see, there is no death for the believer. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, this is what the resurrection signifies, the overcoming of the one enemy that none of us can defeat. Jesus defeats. 
Oh, death, where is your sting? And the overcoming of death is that which the believer receives, not on his own merit, but through the efforts and work, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can overcome death, but not by your effort. You can overcome death because Jesus overcame death. And if you put your faith and your hope in Him, that's how you overcome it. You become a new creation. That's also what the resurrection signifies. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3.3, 3, if you want to see the kingdom of heaven, you have to be born again. And it confuses Nicodemus. Later on in verses five, chapter 3, verses 5-8, through 8, He says, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You see, you have to be born again. You have an issue with sin in your life. There's nothing you can do about it. Paul says in Romans 3.20, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And later on in that same uh, uh, book of Romans chapter 6, verse 23, and the wages of sin is death. See, that's what we brought into the world when we fell. And if Adam hadn't, Adam hadn't screwed it up, I would have screwed it up for you. You see, that's ushered. That's what's handed down. But God, Jesus Christ offers you eternal life and offers you a life in abundance. You see, he says, also, you can live a life abundantly. In John 10, uh, 9 through 10, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You see, what the resurrection also signifies is that you can have life and you can have it in an abundance. You can trade in the Folex and get the real deal. You see, that's what all of this is about. This is about God overcoming the one thing that separated us from Him. The one thing, that he's overcoming and dealing with this sin issue because we couldn't deal with it. We'd hide from it. We know it's there. But we can't deal with it. One of the things I said at the beginning is I love the church because there's no hidden stuff as far as what you see is what you get. And I'm pretty, that's that's kind of me. Most of the members of the church know that I wrestled. I grew up wrestling. But if you're sitting here today and you're thinking, why is this guy telling me I'm dead? Let me tell you why I know that. It's not merely because the Bible says it. It says it's, the Bible says it, so it's true. We know that. It's not merely because of that. Let me tell you what happened when I was 15 years old. I grew up on a wrestling mat. I started when I was four. I finished when I was 21. At 15, I'd wrestled five, six days a week for three hours a day. I poured my life into the sport. My family poured into this sport. At 15 years old, I was an AAU Grand National Champion. Stood on the podium. Parents crying, oh, what an accomplishment. It was everything I'd worked for. And at 15, I'd done it. Got home, my mom had made a sign. I was, oh, how proud I am. Look at what I've done. This is what it's about. Accomplishing. I put the effort in and I accomplished it. I took the medal and I went down to my room. And I thought... Is that it? Is that all I get? All that work, all that time, all that, and this is it. You see, at 15, I realized life sucks. Amen. I busted my butt five and six days a week for three hours a day, doing stuff that most people could never do. Carrying, doing buddy carries up a hill 
only to come back down and do it 10 more times. Running two miles and then sprinting two miles. And then after that, having wrestling practice. I'd worked for this. And I got it. And at 15, I realized this was meaningless. Sure, I've got the story. Sure, I can look at it. But you know what else happened that summer? At 15 years old, I took my first drink. And I hid from life. And I didn't stop drinking until I was 25 years old. I started drinking to hide. And it wasn't just drinking. I started using other things and doing other stuff, looking at porn, trying to find happiness in girls and everything else, trying to find what is it that's wrong. I was dead. So I'm not telling you that you're dead because the Bible says so, although that's true. I'm telling you you're dead because I lived it. I'm telling you you're dead because I've been there. The drugs didn't work. The pornography didn't work. The girls didn't work. The exercise didn't work. The, the grades didn't work. All of the accomplishments that I could muster didn't work. The alcohol, the final thing, didn't work. I was dead. And it wasn't until my wife dragged me into a church and the pastor the first time anybody ever told me the truth of what I knew to be true in my life, the first time anybody said, you're dead. And it resonated. How does this fool know what's going on with me? How does he know what the, the people in the psych program that I'm in don't know? How does he know what the counselors don't know? How does he know all of this? How does he know this is true? And maybe that's you today. It's not some miraculous thing. For me, God knows what's going on in your life. But I will tell you, when I accepted Jesus Christ, it all made sense. Because in that moment, I realized the reality of what life truly is. That God had a purpose for my life. That God had an intention for my life. And nobody ever told me to stop drinking. I began living for Christ. And eventually I didn't need to anymore. I no longer needed it. My wife didn't have to tell me to stop drinking. I knew it was a problem. Nobody, my parents didn't have to say anything. Nobody in the, the clinical psych program that I was in that I was going through in grad school, nobody had to say anything. It just became incompatible with life. You see, I don't, tell you that you're dead just because I want to you know, convict you. I tell you you're dead because I've been you. I've been there. I've been the guy hiding. I've been the guy avoiding. I've been the guy trying to just, just stay out of the silence because I don't want to be alone with me. That's been me. I've been the guy going to the gym for all hours of the day. I've been the guy working and going to school for all hours of the day. I've been the guy that's, I, those are the things, that's it's just to hide. I've been the guy at the bar. I've been the guy, that was me. And trying to hide, trying to avoid it, trying to just, just I don't want to deal with the reality. Until finally somebody said it's the truth. Apart from Jesus Christ, you're dead. If you want to have life, if you want to have eternal life, if you want to understand what it is to live abundantly, I'm going to ask you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's not going to solve. You're not going to walk out of here. Oh, everything's fantastic. You still have your life. I'm sorry. But the bottom line is, you got a purpose behind it, and you know that the God of the universe who spoke this into existence, that's this thing that separates you from him is done and dealt with, and you can stand righteous before him face to face. Do you know what a miracle it is that I can go to God and pray? I don't know that we fully get this. I had a, a young man come into my office, and we were talking. He says, you know, Steve, pray for me that I, I, I really grasp the, the understanding of what it is when I pray, because sometimes I, I just kind of pray. And I thought, man, that's awesome. 
Do you know who we go before when we pray? We're going before a holy God. And so when we pray, we get to come in this connection with him. Why? Because Jesus paid the price and he overcame death for us that we can go before God, that we can have this relationship. What a beautiful picture that is. What a beautiful gift that that is. And that for all of eternity to be apart from the bodies, be together with Christ, that we can live that. Or you can continue to live your life apart from Christ. You continue to look for your hope in politicians. Continue to look for your hope in worldly relationships. Search for your life at the bottom of a bottle, at the end of a pipe. Countless hours of work to put money in your bank account. The next item you want to purchase, but none of this will bring you life. The life you seek comes only through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, Lord, what a gift it is. What a gift it is that you've given us as we celebrate today the overcoming of death that we truly can say, death, where is your sting? But Lord, even as great, I suppose, equally as that, is that we can truly have life, that we can have life abundantly knowing that you have a purpose and an intention for our lives. That it's not us just doing the random things and calling that life. It's not just the, the brain firing synapses. It's not, it's not any of those things, Lord. The life is that which you give us. For you are the author of life. Father, I pray for those who have not yet received this gift. I pray that the Holy Spirit, he would move upon them today, drawing them to you that they would commit their lives unto you to receive this life that you've offered. They would turn from death to life. A miracle that only you can do, God. A miracle that is only offered through your grace and your mercy. And Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, a lot of times we do, uh, churches do what, what they call altar calls. We don't really do that too much here. I, and I, I don't know, we just never really have, and, and I only do them if, if really I feel like God's saying to do an altar call, and I'm not going to do that now. But I do want to tell you, if you're lost, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's a couple options for you. One is you can hit the door and, and think, man, I'm glad that I didn't make me stand up. Or another option is you can come up and talk to me. And so I'm going to ask all the, the, the members and those of you that are saved, um, I love talking to you, I love having time at the end of the service to, to spend time with you, but I'm going to ask you to leave me alone. And I'm going to ask Casey to come up with me. Because I want those who are not believers, this is your time with me. I want you, I don't want you to miss this opportunity. Tomorrow's not a guarantee. So I'm going to carve out this portion of time just for you that I want you. If you have questions, maybe you don't want to accept Christ, you say, is this real? Come find out. For the rest of you, go get your eggs. <laughs> In a few minutes, Dave will be doing photos up here too.